Afternoon, fellas. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very good. Is Joe lurking? I am indeed. There he is. So quite excited today. We've got uh, we've got a cracking guest coming on, haven't we? We have indeed. Yes, we are speaking to Mr. Rob Durrant, who is the senior press officer at Porsche GB. So fingers crossed, we'll get loads of gossip from the inside of Porsche. It's about, it's about as inside as you get, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. So hopefully, some uh, some nice golden nuggets of information is uh, is incoming. What have you boys been up to in the meantime? Anyway, while we wait for Rob, uh, working lots of work, <laughs> uh, <laughs> unexciting stuff. Uh, I tell you what, I did have a bit of a funny episode earlier this week. So I ordered a, a dirty Domino's as a as a bit of dinner. And uh, obviously, with the social distancing measures that are going on at the moment, you've got to tell the guys where to leave your pizza. (laughs) So it's it's dodgy, dodgy drop off. Yeah. So (laughs) in any case, doorbell's gone. I've given it a couple of minutes, gone outside. And uh, yeah, the pizza was sitting on the top of my car, Little Irish. And I was like, (laughs) why the hell is this pizza (laughs) and this bottle of Coke kind of balanced precariously on top of my 911? Came back indoors anyway after collecting it and then realised on the notes that you leave, the delivery notes for the driver, I said, um, leave in port, ring doorbell and leave in Porsche. So I don't know if this <laughs> poor guy has obviously mistaken, well, he has mistaken the Porsche for a Porsche. I don't know if he was trying to get into my car or what. I don't know why the <laughs> alarm wasn't trying, going off. Trying the handles. Yeah, yeah. So he read Porsche as Porsche, which was absolutely brilliant. I had to laugh, but uh, yeah, there That's we go. Hilarious. That's my week anyway. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> have either of you got your wheels on yet? No. Nope. No. Nope. No, nah, tomorrow for me, a chap's coming out, mobile guy, to swap the tyres over, balance and balance the wheels and talk them up. So fingers crossed they fit. The Is that the wheel- guy that I told you about, Johnny Tyres? W- it was Johnny Tyres. So yeah, thanks for, the, thanks for the tip off on that. The wheels, the Foosh wheels are the same uh, dimensions as the factory BBS GT3 wheels on currently. I didn't check the, what do you call it, ET. So I'm hoping that it's going to be a straight fit, no problems at all, but you just, you never know, do you? I'd imagine they'd run somewhere close to stock, wouldn't they, if they're selling them for those, you know, for that sort of era, aren't they? Yes, yeah, I would hope so. I'm really hoping they just bolt straight on. I can use the factory bolts for now. Um, And we won't have any problems with like caliper clearance or anything, but we'll see, we'll see. This, this time words. next week, yeah, exactly. This time next week, we'll, we'll know, won't we? But Joe, when when are you gonna stick on your to, 912? My my problem is knowing what size tires to put on them. So obviously, I'm trying to fit yeah much bigger uh, wheels and rubber onto a car that wasn't designed for it. So I'm, that's my concern is yeah what what I've got clearance wise and what's going to fit. So it's yeah I need to uh, make a, yeah I need to push the button on which size tires to to go for I, and then I think you need to put the wheels on the car without tires. Yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 exactly yeah. my plan. Yeah, get the, get the, the wheels on there. Make sure they don't stick out too far to start with. Otherwise, it'll yeah. be a no go, and you've wasted money on buying tires. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. So I kind of need to do a bit of trial fitting before I yeah. sort of yeah work out what to buy. Um, so yeah, I've hopefully maybe over the weekend if I can get uh, yeah if I can get them bolted on just to give them a check round that might be yeah, might give me what I need to get going next week. Mm. excellent the other one is so, what brand of tires to put on them as well that's that's my next oh, thing because yeah. it's it's kind of a period sort of car so it, it doesn't you know you don't really want yeah you know, new new looking tread pattern on it if you can help it yeah right that's enough tire talk then we'll park that shall we boys and, and get rob in for a chat yep sounds good rob hello how are you doing Hi, Lee. I'm good, thank you. I'm uh, I'm okay. Hope you guys are good too. Rob, senior press officer at Porsche GB, um, how much of an absolute meltdown have you had over the past few weeks with this lockdown crisis? Then I imagine your world's been tipped upside down. Well, I think I think no more than than anyone else's, and um, you know it's it's been uh, it's been challenging all round. I think we're we're you know, first and foremost, um, fortunately, everyone's still still well and okay, and. Um, we've been trying to support everyone that we work with and uh, keep everyone in the loop as much as we can and it's uh, yeah it's been 
things have carried on. We still have things to do. Uh, it's just been very, very different to the kind of things that we normally do. Um, but um, but no, uh, as I say, just just above all, we're just fortunate that um, we've been able to carry on and and work sort of pretty effectively. I think, fortunately, in in our world, your world, my world, you know, we we're used to uh, being able to work remotely. Um, you know, in all sorts of different locations. So I think that's been that's been really sort of helpful, um, just to help us keep coordinated and uh, and just try and try and carry something on. Good, good. Okay. I mean, on the the subject of that, you said your world and our world. I'm on the side of a journalist. You're on the side of PR. Are we teammates these days or adversaries? What do you think? <laughs> I I, th- I think very much sort of in my experience, it's always been uh, teammates. I think. Um, you know, it, it, it's the days of um, that sort of almost adversarial um, positioning that the two uh, the two sides had. Um, I, I think you know we're all wanting the same thing. We're all uh, working towards the same goal, and I think the uh, the great thing, you know, doing things like this, um, it, it's all about you know we're united by that sort of enthusiasm that we've got for automotive, and and particularly in our in our Porsche world, uh, that enthusiasm that we've got for the manufacturer. So. Uh, very much, I think. I think you know, really a team effort across the board. It's interesting you say about um, when you come to PR and PR is such a wide sort of subject. I mean, I, I kind of do you think the do you think it blurs the lines a bit where sort of the landscape changed in terms of um, PR marketing journalism? Uh, yeah, sort of PR used to be very reactive, didn't it? You sort of yeah, you'd be getting out of imagine lots of requests coming in and people wanting to see and do things with you. As now, there's a, a real push on sort of content i mean do you, do you find your world is now creating content rather than sort of just uh, helping other people with product i think it's you're right it, it, everything's evolved at quite a pace and i think no more so than um, the past few years i think yes the boundaries definitely between pr and marketing are, are often quite hard to draw and i think what we tend to sort of go on is is essentially marketing is anything that's a that's a paid placement. So, you know, if if there's actually a, a fee in order to, for that content to be aired, whether it's an advert, whether it's an advertorial, whatever it might be, um, then that that's kind of the remit of marketing. Mm. I think for us we're very much kind of working on the side of, you know, anything that's, of course, there'll be a cost, you know, even just having a car on the press fleet has a cost attached to it, but it, it's that next level. It's not, we're not paying to place content and that's where we take over. So that could be anywhere from a sort of traditional row test, group test, uh, right the way through to, you know, our cars appearing at a fashion show, it, there are all sorts of things where you know there wouldn't necessarily be a fee for doing that, so that that would okay. be our remit. And I think where where it's all sort of difficult to draw the line is is when you've got this sort of ex- rapidly expanding world of YouTube. There's mm. content that is paid for on YouTube, and there's content that isn't. And I think much as it's it's often it's flagged you know, hashtag ad and things like that. There's sometimes a a, a sort of a misinterpretation of just an assumption that because you're appearing on a certain channel that that's paid for. Um, And, you know, in our case, we, we, we're very fortunate to operate with the, with the reputation and and the brand that we have Uh, quite often things that appear from us are, in fact, we, we, we essentially have a rule. We don't pay for, sort of youtube content um so it's all earned which is which is very much our our pr remit so yeah it is different and i think for us it it is a really broad remit all the way through from as i say from from a traditional loan to um somebody on youtube producing sort of content around our cars through all sorts of things so it's probably a broader remit uh, and certainly has more people uh, that we're trying to work with and, and and help achieve their content. So, you know, for us, it's a supporting role. We're we're helping other people create their content. How when on the on the sort of the YouTube subject, I mean, that's such a big. I say up and coming. I've been around a while, but it, is Porsche quite supportive of people that are trying to do the sort of organic YouTube channels these days, or or is it is it quite guarded? No, we, we we really um it's something that we've kind of done uh, increasing over the past three or four years uh, as the uh, as the space as it were has grown, um and I think 
we've got to look at it in different ways. So like anything, um, a, a, a great man once said to me, uh, measurement is management. And you, you do need to sort of understand what you're doing to be able to measure it. Um, and that is a complicated process. And that process takes a little bit of time to evolve. So, um, you know, being honest at the moment, YouTube is a difficult one for us to pin down in terms of an actual value. You know, how would we fit it into the metrics that we use? Uh, we're still working on that. So it means that we do YouTube um, not because we're essentially getting hard and fast brownie points, uh, but because we know it's the right thing to do and it's it, it's the way the future is going to be. Um, and to clarify that, it's not to say the future is just YouTube. The future is expanding. You know, it's not we don't. And this is a, a sort of personal view as well, that I don't feel that YouTube is, is growing to the, at the expense of other things. I think it's opening up a, a lot of new people to cars who perhaps didn't have anything that quite suited the way that they wanted to engage with cars. So I think there's a big chunk of that YouTube audience is, is additional, which is ultimately a really positive thing for those of us in the industry, that there's more people able to engage with cars and, and take part in it. So it, whether, you know, and this, this isn't just in the YouTube space, this is this whatever the medium, we, we try to find ways within the pretty small uh, capacity that we have. I mean, our, our fleet is is normally numbers or just over 20 cars. So it's, it's pretty small in the general scheme of things. Um, so we try to sort of find ways and be clever to not only support the big magazines and the, 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 the big websites and the big YouTubers, um, we really do have a program to try and support those that are up and coming. So the new channels or the new websites or the new blogs, because everyone ultimately has to start somewhere. Um, and we, we try to support that and nurture that as much as we can, because it's, it's as much our obligation to help those guys uh, as it is the ones that are established. So yeah, we, we try to just be clever with our resource to try and do a bit of everything. I see there's a, a new, um, well, it's fairly new, is an Instagram uh, channel, uh, Type 7. Um, mm. Now, that's I think that's actually funded by Porsche, Porsche in some ways. Um, but that's quite interesting in that it's not just about the cars. It's about more lifestyle. Is that something that you've been involved in at all, Rob? Yeah, we haven't, uh, we haven't had a huge amount to do uh, directly with Type 7 because, um, again, as you say, it's a, it's a sort of a pay channel. So... Um, type seven will go through um, and does go through more the um, the central um, channels uh, and through the marketing channels. Uh, it's, it's a little bit um, to give you an idea of how the split works in the UK. Um, we tend to the, the the sort of channels like LinkedIn, Instagram tend to be curated and managed by the marketing team. Uh, and we have an input into that. And the strongest thing that we input into is Twitter, uh, purely because I think Twitter has fallen into that realm of being more of a news feed. Um, so we have input into that with news communications. Um, but you're right. I mean, Type 7, be that as it may, kind of more through the marketing channels, um, that sort of inclusion of more of a lifestyle aspect of the cars, you could argue it's it's the cars in a context, uh, I think is quite quite a nice thing to sort of add in because it, it makes them, to a lot of people, relate a lot more, whether it's yeah. aspirational or, or whatever it might be, it's quite relatable. Yeah, Porsche is seen as a, a prestige vehicle. Um, I was wondering if, if working for a company like Porsche um, is considered, you know, are you at the pinnacle of your industry? I think, I think it's definitely... Um, it, 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 you do notice and, and you're aware of, of the brand that you represent because you have, um, you know, everyone, um, you know, essentially in my seat, whoever they're doing it for feels a real obligation to the brand uh, that they work for. And, and that's kind of a natural, natural thing, I think. Um, but certainly for us, with that sort of that obligation that we have and a degree of the weight of, of the Porsche uh, standing and, and heritage and, uh, everything that goes with it i think there's a you do feel very privileged to be doing it because it's not i think it's not even necessarily sort of how 
um, that, you know, as a manufacturer, we position the cars in terms of pricing, you know, whether you can put a premium tag on it or an ultra premium tag on it. I think that there are brands that have a real kind of heritage and you're always going to feel a little bit more of a weight of responsibility when you've got, you know, 50 years, 70 years, you know, 120 plus years of, of, uh, of heritage. Um, it's a big thing to be a part of. And I think, um, definitely when you, especially when you have that enthusiasm for, for, for cars, for motorsport, for competition, and you're working with a brand like Porsche that, that I think has, for those of us that work at Porsche, we, we have this real, we're not just doing it because it's, it's just another job. It's yeah. not as if we, we, we're, sort of supporting white goods or whatever it might be yeah we we chosen um and and worked hard to try and get a place with porsche because yeah we, we have an emotional investment to it so yeah i think it's it's a it's a big factor for all of us and and i think it, it's probably not widely sort of recognized much outside of the industry but porsche is a very big brand but a very very small team so to put that into perspective, in, in the UK, we have about 150 people working in Porsche cars, Great Britain, which is which is actually quite small. You know, it's one of the smallest teams around the world in terms of the uh, based against the, the, the number of cars that uh, that are bought. So you have to have that passion and drive because we are a small team serving a big, a big, big brand, big reputation. Absolutely. And similarly with that then, Rob, I mean, Porsche has a you know, revenue of 28 billion euros. You mentioned the numbers in terms of GB as 150 staff, but does, does Porsche as a global brand that it is, does it, does it feel like a big company or a small company? It, it feels like yeah. a really small company. Um, uh, and that's because it is a really small company. And I think, um, you know, it, it, if you look back to the origins of Porsche and, and, and that ethos that was born through you know, the first three, five, six competition, it was always trying to make the more or the most of what you had. So you try and develop something that was lightweight to make more use of the engine. And it's just really interesting having sort of joined Porsche just over four years ago, that that ethos it, it, to me feels very much still a part of the company, that we, we, we're we very efficient, we're very good with the way we work, um, that we have a small team, but we are still able to achieve something that has that, that established as one of the leading car manufacturers in the world. And I think, and that's a really nice thing on a day-to-day basis, whether it's just you know, popping over to see the colleagues in marketing or, or motorsport or picking up the phone to the team in Germany, you know, joining a conference call, meeting people on events. You, you get to know that small circle of people very quickly and you get to know them very well. And I think that that's one of the things that I've I've really enjoyed is that that really getting to know people and having that 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 human side to it. So, yeah, it, it really does feel like a small company. OK, and that's interesting to hear. And I think quite refreshing as well. It has to be said, particularly as to how much Porsche has grown almost exponentially over the past 10 years or so. Um, but I mean, Rob, kind of. Knowing you as I do, you've got to be one of the most hardworking people that I know of in the industry. I mean, I've called you at all sorts of hours of the day. And, and I, whatever time I've been at the Porsche Center, Porsche HQ, a GB, dropping cars off or collecting them, you seem to be there. And I kind of I want to help portray that to, to people listening at home as the sort of uh, lengths that you have to go to in order to facilitate not just the media, but then also to present enthusiasts with good content so like an international launch for example what sort of work goes into that um and by by that you know it's not just organizing the event it's choosing the location um, at the locations what takes precedence good driving roads or picturesque scenery you know can you kind of paint us a picture on that yeah of course i I think I mean, it, it's. I suppose the first thing, to say from from my point of view, is um, you know, I, I I appreciate you uh, you you sort of uh, understanding the effort that goes in, and and I think it's um, you know it's something we try to do because we are you know we are smaller. It means that we can be more personal in the way we we support and respond to what people need. Um, and I think you know, don't don't tell any of the senior team at Reading, but you know, I I, I absolutely love what I do, and I I I honestly. You know, it, it's not a 
it's never a chore. You know, turning up for work is never a chore. So I think, um, you know, it, it, it's it's always just something that I welcome that opportunity just to be, you know, engaging with people and doing things and just working with the cars. So um, and I think a lot of us share that enthusiasm. Um, but in terms of the sort of an, an international event, um, we have, we're lucky that we have really great support from the team in Germany. So they have, uh, again, a sort of a small but, but sort of very dedicated team um, who, uh, again, with, we, and you tend to find that as a trend with Porsche, they, they tend to have been there a little bit longer. Um, I think our retention rates are, are pretty high, um, which is great because people build up that experience, that knowledge, um, and that's very much the case with the events team in Germany. So what will normally happen is that we'll know roughly um, what the uh, what the upcoming schedule is for the next year in terms of products, what might be happening, what launches we might be doing. Uh, it's all very much uh, a movable feast for us because there's a lot of things at play and things do shift around quite a lot. Um, and then what they'll do is um, sometimes, uh, depending on the model, so, you know, put it into perspective, say, for example, we launched the eighth generation 911, the 992 uh, in Valencia last January. Um, that's going to be a really big one. Um, you know, that's one of the most important things for us. So it was important that we had an event venue that could cope with a high volume, that was able to deliver what we knew people were going to want. Um, so I think that's the first and foremost, is that everything, whether we do it as a UK national event or whether it's a, a bigger international event, um, everything's kind of reverse engineered. So we won't necessarily say, oh, it's a new 911. We need to go to the most glamorous place we can find because that that would be lovely. And there's definitely a place for that. Um, but for a 911, it's probably more important. People are going to want to see the heritage models. They are going to want to be doing pieces to camera. They are going to be wanting to drive on track. They are going to want to drive on some great roads. And, and all of that's got to be the most important thing. So it's always, what do we want to deliver? What are people going to need? And then how do we sort of blend the two and create a, a, a sort of event framework that's going to work? Uh, and that's why we chose Valencia, because the circuit was perfect. It had additional facilities that were all within easy reach of, of the pit lane where we based. Um, it all came together really well. So, um, it, again, it's a pretty sort of fairly sort of tight process to get to that point. Um, but again, just sort of worth um, different sort of people um, in, in your position will have different experiences from different manufacturers. But in terms of the numbers, uh, brand new 911 launch, I, I think we I think we had about 10 slots uh, for the UK. So it's, it's really the events are, you know, correspondingly small. <laughs> um, you know, it'd be lovely to have 25, 30 uh, slots available but it's not always possible and and you know and the other thing that we look at is is everyone's time is precious and i think particularly in the uk everyone's working really hard to produce content to to write up reviews and quite often when we go on these events e even just when you're on the shuttle back to the airport the guys are sort of sat on the laptops they're starting to write things up um it's, it's a lot of pressure so you know, if if do you know what if if a British Airways business class flight gives us the best timings to get people out and back as efficiently for their time as possible, we'll do it. If it's an easy jet flight, we'll do it. You know, that's that's and that we get a lot of support, I think, and that that's our feedback that we get, and that and that's what we do. We we take a lot of feedback and process that in. It, it's a lot of it is just as I say, delivering what helps people. Of the, um, do you think the days of sort of the razzmatazz of, of sort of um, you know, sort of uh, impressing journalists has kind of moved on a little bit, where it's more about their time and and getting the content out there rather than sort of buttering them up the right way. I, th I think I think it, it, it is all about just timing and efficient use of people's time, and I think mm. as I say, that, that there'll always be a place and a time. I think for a little bit of the razzmatazz because um, you know it it, it, it is. Yeah, it, there are times when it when it's just yeah, it suit it suits the, the mood and it just fits well. Um, but I think it's very much um, you know, again maybe more reflective of Porsche. And I, I only have experience of doing these events 
with Porsche. Um, but I think, you know, for us, again, we're in that sort of position where it is all about, you know, the products do tend to speak for themselves. It's all about the engineering. You know, we, we'd rather sort of have a sit down for 45 minutes with a chassis engineer and talk about springs and dampers. And, you know, I remember my first launch being the GT2 RS launch, um, you know, which for a real kind of you know, high performance fan like me was 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 just incredible. Just listening spellbound to Andreas Preuninger as he, he talks about, you know, the, the, the helper springs and the primary springs on a GT2 RS. And I think that's that's the most important thing for us. So that will always be the primary focus. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you were saying that, um, you know, you've got limited slots for these type of events. How how the hell do you pick who goes? That must be so difficult. It is really tough. It is one of the hardest things that we do uh, is, is trying to sort of balance that out. And, and we have to kind of be, we, we try to be clever with it in terms of sort of understanding people who might be able to go and cover it for two or three publications um there are other publications who understandably would rather just send their own correspondence so we we have to balance it um and it's not you know unfortunately it's it's a fairly thankless task that you're never going to please everyone all the time um so what we then try and do is if if we know that slots are limited so you know for example uh with a 911 launch in in spain uh we knew that slots were limited um we knew it was a very important car for us um so we talk to the team in Germany we have a great relationship with those guys and they they really are you know like us just really keen to help and uh, and try and make things happen and and we managed there was a, a day it was a Sunday which was a down day on the launch and we said look you know any chance that we can bring some people down just for the day and they said okay you organize it because you know we won't have an infrastructure there because we just can't you know we can't support seven days a week which is you know totally understandable um but we we managed to make it work we managed to get an additional 10 people um out to spain to drive the cars you know within a, an element of the framework that existed um other times you know we might be able to get a car over to the uk not long after the international launch um in which case, you know, people can do some, you know, it's still a German car, left-hand drive, but at least it's a bit more accessible. So they might test it for a few hours out of Reading, or we might base ourselves somewhere near nice roads and people come up and drive it for the day. There's always ways you can think laterally to to try and include as many people that we work with as we can. In a way, Rob, it's where you say it's a thankless task in terms of, you know, what members of the media can get the seat on the plane. Um, I, I assimilate it really to the similar thankless task that a dealer principal will have in allocating GT cars. <laughs> um, so I think it's all Sounds very relatable. It? it is. It very, very much is. And I think I'd just like to make the point as well to add to what Rob says off your point, Joe, of having to kind of lavish journalists with with, you know, I don't know just gifts or whatever it is that just doesn't happen um certainly in my lifetime in the industry um i i, I know that things used to happen where companies and it, i've heard this off much older journalists that have been around for a lot longer and, and launches there'd be like ipads and stuff going around i mean that is crazy and those days are long gone i think for me and i hope my employers aren't listening to this you know, even the opportunity to drive a Porsche, you know, and if it's in somewhere like, you know, far flung Slovakia, well, you know, I'll walk there barefoot on broken glass to drive the car. <laughs> and and I think, you know, many, many journalists would say the same, you know, I mean, don't don't pay me. The, the, the very fact that you get to sit in these iconic cars, this absolute fear of engineering and experience these cars, not even first, but just at all, is just absolutely the greatest privilege. Um, and, and this is why I imagine, Rob, your role at Porsche is arguably more difficult than perhaps another manufacturer, because I can damn well bet that there's a few more journalists knocking on your door than there would be at, at another manufacturer, say, that just does, <laughs> yeah, that, you know, that just does hatchbacks or family saloons or something. Yeah, you know, I don't want to cause offence to anybody out there, but it is, I think you're so right, it's a thankless task. You you can't win. And I think we need to accept that as much as you. <laughs> <laughs> No, you, I, I want right. to know, Rob, how does um, how did Lee ever make the list for Spain? 
I know, I know. Unbelievable. Well, I couldn't, I couldn't bear the thought of him walking on broken glass. So um, <laughs> we, uh, we had to let him along. But um, we had a, we had a great time in uh, in Greece when we did the nine eleven cabriolet. Um, that was, uh, you know, another one of those events that um, I don't know. It, it sort of stuck in the mind. It was just, you know, fairly fairly straightforward. But it was just, it was just a great couple of days. I think we um, uh, we didn't even get particularly lucky with the weather. Um, but uh, but no, it's just one of those great events that just came together. A little bit uh, off the wall in terms of location, but um, but yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, Lee, didn't, didn't you um, bump into somebody at one of those events that give you a great little insight? I can't remember who it was. I remember you came back and mentioned that you you were chatting to somebody at one of the launch events. That and uh, can you remember who that was? Um, it might have been Kyle Fortune, a um, journalist that that writes for T Nine Eleven. Absolutely splendid chap, and and Kyle kind of. It, he writes a lot of the launch events or covers a lot of the launch events, not only for Total 911, but for different um, different media outlets. And, and again, not just Porsche. And he's someone that's very well oiled in going to these. And it was it was amazing for me as just an absolute rookie by comparison, not been to an international launch before, just to see how Kyle um, handled himself, how he approached the, the bigger wigs at Porsche, many of which he's cultivated fantastic relationships with. Um, it was an absolute kind of consummate professional and a real kind of eye opener as to, for me, again, almost looking from the outside is to be like, that is what an absolute top class automotive journalist looks like to me, you know. Um, I, I hope Carl's not listening to this. It's very gushing, but it, it really was. It was, it was, a, it was a real eye opener, you know. And that's clearly someone that's that's been there and, and done it, and and has clearly benefited from that, you know. Yeah, I, th- I think you know from from echoing that from our side, I think um, it's one thing that I, I'm always really impressed with is that I think there's a. I mean, I, I don't know. It's a long time since I sort of uh, read a car magazine purely just as a as a reader. Um, you know, I still really enjoy reading car magazines, but you can't help, you can't help but you know view it in a different way because you mm. you, you know the nuts and bolts so much. But it was one of those things that having there are there are so many people that I get to work with who were just so formative in the early years of of my sort of automotive development and just building that passion that's kind of spilled over into a into a full time uh, into a full time role. Um, and it is weird, you know, you do. Certainly, I feel a bit, you know, a bit starstruck um, meeting some of these guys, and I think there's not always an appreciation of just how much goes into it, how difficult it is. Whether it's you know as an editor, as a as a freelance journalist, as a road test editor, um, as a staff writer, it, it's really tough. And I think mm. it's it's not as easy as you say those days of you know sort of a, a junket, as it were, almost a sort of a um, yeah, jolly. It, it's just not that at all. Um, and I think when I see how hard the guys work, how you know, really structured they are with their, the driving of the cars, the questions that they ask, the way they use their time, how much time they put into it. Um, you know, it's it's from our point of view, it, it's time consuming because we're on an event and we're trying to sort of facilitate what everyone needs and all the requests. Um, but at the same time, the sort of the, the in inverted commas, the, the, the day job, what's happening back at the office still goes on. So you're almost kind of trying to run two two jobs at the same time. But it's it's the same for all the journalists that come with us is that, you know, the emails are still coming in. You still got deadlines and you've got to submit copy. It, it's a real pressure environment. So that kind of really slick product that comes out the end that, that people can read online or, or subscribe to or, or, you know, buy the magazine, it, it, it's there's a, a lot goes into it. And, and we, we mm. do have absolute respect for that. Yeah, that's cool, isn't it? The, you know, you're saying about being sort of starstruck with some people. I mean, where, where obviously Porsche is so heavily linked with motorsport, do you, do you, you must get to, I'm guessing even in quite a casual setting, yeah, you know, sit down and have coffee with some of the real big, yeah, you know, motorsport greats. I mean, is there is there anything you share with us there in terms of people that have sort of, yeah, had had a an impact on what you've done, or, or you know, the people that kind of have really surprised you along the way? I think it's yeah. I mean, it, it, it is surreal sometimes that you are, you know, just just rubbing shoulders with with people like Mark Webber who was one of the first drivers that I really remember following all the way through from Formula 3000 into a Formula 1 career and then sort of out the uh, out the other side so mm. it, it was 
you know, incredible to sort of meet someone that you, you've in a way been aware of for so long, but in a kind of a, in a relaxed kind of informal way. And, you know, you do realise that a lot of these people are just, they're just they're genuinely really nice people. I mean, I, I can hand on heart, and I'm not just saying this, I, there, there, there's no one that I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't wouldn't sit and have a drink with until the small hours just, just chatting about stuff. Um, they're, they're great people. And I think it's, you know, and you find yourself in these surreal situations. One one that springs to mind was um, we um, my first Goodwood Festival of Speed with Porsche was 2016, and we decided that to uh, to beat the queues, we would offer a shuttle service in towards the house, um, into the VIP drop off point. Um, the only difference we're not the only ones that do that. The only difference was that we decided we'd do it with full blown race cars. <laughs> so um, we had. Um, we had three uh, 911 GT3 Cup cars from Carrera Cup GB, uh, plus two of the uh, 718 GT4 Club Sports. And uh, I was, um, just to kind of help with capacity at peak times, I was, uh, well, I sort of volunteered myself to uh, jump into the uh, GT4 Club Sport and do a couple of runs in. And um, I remember uh, Mark Lieb, who at that point had, had literally just won the month before, just won Le Mans uh, in the 919 um, in June 2016. And uh, he turned up and uh, the team said, look, you know, can you can you run Mark in? He just needs to sign on as a driver. Yep, you know, not a problem. And uh, he sort of looked at me and looked at the car and uh, he said, I'm, I'm not a very good passenger. Uh, I said, well, you know, it, yeah, it would be fine. We're not going to go particularly quick, and uh, you know, we it, we're just going to drive in towards the house. So we we got him in, strapped him in, and uh, just as we got ready to go, he looked across at me and he said, uh, "If you kill me, at least I've won Le Mans." <laughs> um, <laughs> just absolutely deadpan, and I, it's just so deadpan. I was like. Maybe he's serious, um, but, um, but but all, all went well, and um, and and it's the same with we 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 we're very fortunate to work a lot with uh, with some of our legends as well as our our, our modern day legends, and um, uh, you know working with Derek Bell, um, who again was just one of those names that was just you know I had a Scalectrics of a nine six two that had his name on it, you know it, it it's. It's quite incredible, kind of meeting these guys and and just the the humility that they have. You know, they 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 are quite humble, quite realistic um, in the way they um, they look at their achievements and and which are of course incredible. And um, you know, I've spent a lot of time uh, with the past year with the anniversary of the nine seventeen and now the anniversary of the first win uh, from Le Mans uh, in nineteen seventy uh, with uh, with Richard Atwood and. Um, What's Richard was Richard someone like spend time with. I mean, he must be quite a character. Yeah, Richard. Richard is. He's. Um, he. He really is uh, just an incredible guy. He. He's very. One thing that you realise that these these sort of drivers, particularly from that kind of era, and I think we we forget how young people like Derek Bell and Jackie X started. That much as they had a great history going into the nineteen eighties. They were still racing cars right back in that you know really dangerous era of the late sixties into the seventies um and there's something that they have this real there's a there's a real kind of composure and a metal you can just see that they have an, a core of absolute cast iron um to have been able to do the things that they do and and that's it's incredible that especially as they get older that that doesn't diminish in any way shape or form. Um, and I think you know Richard's Richard's great. I mean, he he's got he he's he's very um, he, he he almost when you first meet him, he he kind of tests you. He'll he'll push you a little bit to see how you respond, and then he'll sort of decide whether you're okay or not. Um, and and I I must have passed the test because um, we we've, we've done quite a few things together, and uh, we we do get on very well. And I think. Um, he, he's he's brilliant very very dry sense of humor and i think um we we did a, an event to um celebrate uh, uh 70 years of, of porsche in north america at the end of last year um so december 20 uh, 2019 and um he uh uh, we we ended up uh, driving back from one of the locations in a, a cayenne trans siberia 
And uh, it, it was very odd that we decided that I was going to do driving duties and Richard was going to co-drive. Um, so he settled himself down in the passenger seat. He had uh, he, he brought a cookie with him from uh, from our lunch pack, uh, and then promptly was uh, deciphering how to navigate using Google Maps on my phone. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I had probably the most qualified co-driver I've ever had uh, in between shouting directions and mouthfuls of cookies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> surreal <laughs> so yeah yes another one of those very very surreal experiences um but um but yes and then you know back at the racetrack it was um the weather was 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 actually um pretty poor made me feel quite at home um despite uh despite it being northern california um mm-hmm. and uh you know there was a little bit of sort of concern about driving the 917 so um the museum had had shipped the 917 along with a few other cars out to uh, California for the event. So um, they said, look, Richard, you know, it, it is soaking wet. Do you mind just taking out the 917, seeing what you think? He was like, yeah, absolutely fine. It, it, in he got, off he went, you know, splashed through the puddles. Um, but, yeah, it's just that not at all phased. Um, it was really impressive. And, 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 you know, you could see he was going around a fair old lick as well. Um and I think, you know, case in point was when, if anyone uh, has watched the uh, piece from Series 3 of the Grand Tour, where uh, Richard in a 917 and a flat cap uh, takes on uh, Neil Jani in a, in a GT2 RS and a crash helmet um, and does a, does a pretty good job in it. Pretty mm-hmm. good job. Yeah, you still got it. <laughs> Talking of sort of on-track adventures, um, have you got, got any other adventures that you'd like to share with us? Um, well, I, th- I think we we do um, we do get the opportunity to do uh, to do a few sort of bits and pieces and and uh, steal the odd lap here and there. And I think um, it, it's one of the uh, one of the sort of biggest sort of motivators for me in terms of um, uh, moving to Porsche and uh, and taking on this role was um, thinking back to my own sort of fleeting racing days. Um, I, I I always recall I, I was never sort of fortunate enough to race uh, a nine eleven. In those days, it was a, uh, and I'm 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 dating myself here, but uh, in those days it was the nine nine six, both the cup cars, but also the uh, the RS and then the RSR versions. Um, and to me, you know, they were they were the cars that were dominating sports car and endurance racing at the time. They were ultra successful, and to me, that shape. Uh, and I, I, I also have a scale electrics of those too, um, was just really synonymous with with sports car racing and what I was aspiring to, and it always stuck in my mind um, as a as a sort of twenty something year old race driver that we always we'd have to uh, our car would have to get towed uh, all the way down to the pits up to the start line. You could only fire it up a certain number of minutes before the race would start. There was a whole process to it. And while we're sort of busying ourselves doing all that sort of thing, um, you'd see the uh, the Porsche teams would just uh, fire the cars up in the awning. They'd potter down under their own steam, turn off, turn on again, move to the grid, turn off. It was it was just it was the most demoralising thing. And then set off and then fill out the podium. Um, it was really you know just at that point in time not having any sort of particular allegiance um or, or leaning or whatever you might call it just to see you know that kind of depth of engineering even in a race car was was so impressive and i think that 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 was one of the things that really kind of left a left a mark so um yeah fond fond memories on track and then uh, and then yes you know the opportunities to drive um every now and again to to um you know drove uh, Scrubbed in a set of tyres uh, in a GT4 <laughs> club sport, um, which uh, which was very understanding. I think the motorsport team appreciates. Uh, sometimes they just see me staring at the uh, staring down the pit lane with a wistful look in my eye. But um, <laughs> and it it, it, it does recall. Um, I remember the first uh, Carrera Cup media day that I did, which was uh, literally I, I think a week after I joined in in March 2016. And uh, it's always one of the bigger moments is when we line the cars up as a grid to go and do the um, the group shot. And uh, you have all the cars, 20-something cars, all lined up at the uh, pit exit. The light goes green and off they go. And, um, again, another one of my sort of inspirations was watching uh, Tim Harvey in the Super Touring days, you know, winning at the Donington 
uh, Grand Prix, uh, European Grand Prix support race in 93. Uh, sorry, 90. Yeah, that was 93. And then um, uh, going on to um, race with BMW, uh, well, uh, it's Renault and then uh, Volvo and very much an inspiration. And I think uh, I sort of looked over and, and, and there was Tim. I'd, I'd, I'd never really met him before. And he uh, he was doing exactly the same thing as me, just watching the cars um, disappear out the pit lane, and we just we caught each other's look, and you, we we just knew we were both thinking exactly the same thing. Um, <laughs> although I think um, yeah, if if we were both to jump into a cup car, I think his uh, his chance of being straight on the pace would be much higher than mine, because uh, something I hadn't sort of fully appreciated was was uh, that having sort of retired from touring cars was. Uh, you know, he's still our most successful career a cup driver by uh, by a reasonable margin. I mean, 36 wins. Um, yeah. It's going to take some beating. Funny you mention Richard Atwood. I have a story which I don't know if you're aware of. It seems to be a bit of an old wives' tale. I'm hoping it's true. Is uh, somebody, I say Citibank or some, some London firm had hired the PEC for the morning, uh, invited the team up for a morning messing around in the cars at the PEC as a, as a, a gift for the for the time. And Richard Atwood was trying to teach the guys there some basic kind of car control techniques, none of them listening whatsoever. So the story goes at lunchtime, he lined them all up at the the canteen area of the PC with the glass panes overlooking the the handling circuit for PC. And there's Kane, this 911 round the track. And everyone's been like, what? Not knowing who he is, you know, blimey, the granddad can drive. And and he's kind of come back in and said, right, you know, now are you going to start listening to me? And, uh, Apparently, they've said to him, you know, mate, have you done any racing in your time? And he didn't even tell them that he was Porsche's first ever Le Mans winner. He's just turned around and said, yeah, I've just done a bit of club racing in my spare time. I I can't remember who told me that. It might have been maybe Richard Bott at the PC. I could be Mm. could be really wrong there. But um, he is an absolutely fantastic individual. It has to be said. Yeah, he he really is, and that 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 sounds absolutely like the sort of thing that uh, that he do. He um, e- even when I first met him, I I, I was a bit um, again so quite apprehensive um, and uh, very aware as well that he has a you know really impressive history in Formula One. Um, when you think that he quite often would super sub in, and um, you know he had a, a, a second place finish in the BRM at Monaco. I think he super subbed for for Jock and Rint, um, <laughs> and and was uh, you know was top placed again. And I think you know that that's just massively impressive. Um, but um, but he was very when I sort of first brought it up, he, he, he was, yeah, again, just very much sort of like, oh, well, you know, um, it was, it was sort of what you did in those days, just very, very humble about, uh, everything that he'd done. And, uh, one thing I hadn't, hadn't really sort of appreciated until I got to know Richard a lot better was that he was really sort of quite involved, uh, as an apprentice in the, in the engineering side of things. Okay. Um, so he had a real kind of, um, yeah, a, a real understanding of the mechanicals behind the cars. And I think so much of his success in that era when, you know, reliability wasn't what it is now, uh, came down to that that just that that mechanical understanding and that empathy that he had for what was what was going on with the car. Um, he could nurse things around the track and get it, yeah, get it to the end. It, it, exactly. And 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 he told me a story about sitting on the uh, on the start line at Spa. Uh, in a 917 so it's quite a steep run down because the start finish line wasn't the f1 start finish line on the way into la source it was the start finish line on the on the run down towards eau rouge um and re- waiting for the flag to drop and, and the engine stalled um and he said i knew that that was because the the, the float in the carburetor because of the angle uh, had just started the engine so I said, rather than sitting there trying to start it, which I knew would flatten the battery and then we'd be out, he said, I just dipped the clutch, let it roll all the way down to the bottom of uh, uh, a rouge, um, put the ignition on to reprime the uh, the lines, fired it up and off it went. And I think he, I think he, they finished second or something. Uh, and you just think again, it's just that that straight away he was quite calm. You know, you'd imagine being on that kind of grid, <laughs> you'd, you'd be flustered, but it was just quite calm and collected. No, I'm just going to do this, and then off we go. And and it's it's that it's that real depth that you you don't you don't really get until you really sort of spend time and just talk to people. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Fantastic bloke. And funnily enough, when you mentioned his dry sense of humour as well, I remember there was a time. I can't remember if you were at Porsche 
by then or not, Rob, but it was a SMMT media test day at Millbrook Proving Ground. And Richard was there for the day in the 991 Gen 1, I'm going to say, Turbo S cab, possibly Gen 2, that sort of time. Mm. And he was taking journalists out for passenger laps on the high-speed bowl. And as you well know, on that media test day, on the high-speed bowl, the maximum permitted speed is 100 miles an hour, isn't it? And uh, yeah. in any case, that meant nothing to Richard. So we've gone out <laughs> and uh, we're going along. And he had to stay. It was in the, the inner four lanes, I think, of six. In any case, we're hammering along. Uh, obviously, we're in a cab, but the roof's up. But he's got one hand on the wheel. His other hand is kind of gesticulating. I think he was talking about his old Peugeot at the time or something. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, we, we were on the outermost lane. So, you know, the car is at an angle, <laughs> uh, to say the least. We were caning it. Oh, it was approaching 160. You, you, I, could, I mean, you talk about compression. I think my head was being put into the floor pad. <laughs> and, uh, and then it kind of come through on the radio that, oh, we've, we've had a message from um, – the clerks or the, you know the owners of the course that it's it's a hundred mile an hour and it's inner four lanes only can the 991 turbo s cab please remove itself from the outer lane and the, richard was absolutely gobsmacked flabbergasted he was like do these people not know i've won them on <laughs> it was so good and it was just like oh, it was amazing it was so worth getting in trouble for and like just like he's pure his pure innocence and sense of humor on it was outrageous but yeah like like you say what a guy what an absolute yeah. guy he, he he always has that sort of twinkle in his eye, and uh, I, I, I'm not going to spoil it because I'm hoping it'll uh, it'll end up in print at some point in time. But uh, I, I have had um, a sneak preview of his school report from when he was four, um, <laughs> and um, yeah, he was um, he was quite a strong, uh, cheeky personality even at four years old. <laughs> it's good. It's great to hear. He's top man, top man. Um, Rob, we'll bring it back to you if that's okay. Where you were mentioning, obviously, your, your racing history, I mean, you know, racing in British GT is absolutely incredible. Um, you have a pretty good handle on how to drive these cars. So how does a GT3 Cup car, a current one, compare to the 991 Gen 2 GT3 RS then? It is quite interesting. I, I've, I've only sort of fleetingly driven a Cup car, so not, not really at, uh, at speed. Um, but... Um, but I have I have been lucky enough to do a few laps in the in the GT3 RS uh, and the GT3 as well. And um, what's interesting is sort of putting that together with with the feedback I've had from from other journalists that have driven the GT3 Cup. I think that there's eighty percent of a GT3 Cup is the same as the GT3 and GT3 RS road cars. So there's there's quite a high degree of commonality. Um, but I think. As soon as you get into the cup, it's amazing how even just having that that interior completely stripped down just changes the feel and the environment. It's like anything. You could get into a car that you've driven daily for 10 years. If you then got into the same car with you know a seat that's as low as it can go and all the interior stripped out, it, it would feel completely different. And I think it's the same thing with a cup car. I think once you sort of get going, there's a lot more transmission noise because of the um the straight cut gears that you have in the race car um but there's no mistaking the sound of the engine and i think that you know that that was the first thing that struck me was i remember when the gen 2 gt3 we launched it in the uk up at anglesey and i'd just come from donington park where we had a carrera cup round to then go to anglesey and i remember just the, the the road car driving out the pits at Anglesey and thinking, hang on a minute, where am I again? It, it just sounded exactly the same. Um, and I think that's a great thing. You know, the engine is exactly the same. So in terms of its power characteristics, the noise, the only reason the race car develops 15 horsepower less is because the rev limits drop from 9,000 on the road car to 8.5 on the race car. So, you know, that that in the way it delivers the power, is is really the same and, and and really quite familiar and obviously there's the you know the traditional 911 handling traits which you know or, or more i should say you know the way you drive it which is very much uh, a different driving style so you drive it more like you would a, a single seater because of the weight distribution yeah um, so the way you would get the car to perform at its best 
is very much the same, whether it's a slightly softer road focus GT3 uh, or an absolute, you know, full on dedicated race suspension setup in the cup car. Uh, and that's just the biggest difference is that you know, the GT3 has to deal with, you know, potholes, lumps, bumps and, and broken surfaces. Um, whereas the cup car is just purely there to go around a billiard table smooth uh, racetrack. Mm-hmm. But, um, but yeah, I think, and the thing that always surprises me that I never, having done a sort of a, a, a stint um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a driving coach, is that I did a lot of track days and there, are, there really are very few cars that can go on a track day and be driven by a driver who is capable of extracting sort of eight, nine, ten tenths out of that car and to do that repeatedly over prolonged periods. And I think, you know, that's part of the massive respect that I had sort of building up to where I am now was seeing people in, you know, in those days it was a 996 GT3 RS or, you know, whatever it might be on track days who would just lap after lap after lap, the car would do it. Um, Mm. And that is, that is unusual to jump into a road car that not only doesn't feel out of place on a track, but that couldn't do that all day. You know, you could have an open pit lane day and you could drive, you know, six hours and just stop for refueling. And they're, they're even good on the on the on the tyres. You know, as we discovered um, when we launched the GT3, uh, the Gen 2991 uh, GT3, that with the Cup 2 tyres, uh, we were anticipating changing them twice a day. Uh, as it is, one set was doing two days. Um, Amazing. Which, which is really impressive. I think it's what the it's kind of it's what the car's been designed for out of the factory though isn't it that's the difference isn't it that it's not rather than taking a, a road car and trying to make it track worthy they kind of it's it's the engineering is sort of track focused and then rain back in for the road would you agree with that yeah i think so that there's a real you know there is a real technology transfer between the race programs and the road programs and mm-hmm. vice versa and i think it's something that it's is almost a bit of a cliche that that you know, it's almost something you say, but no one really knows, you know, how much it, it is related. But I think the interesting thing for us is just in terms of, you know, underlining that for us is the fact that, you know, at Visac, you have the GT department and the motorsport department are both in the same building. You know, they literally, they, they sit next to each other. They can just wander down the corridor, chat to each other. There is such a close sort of relationship between the two. And, and, you know, I, I know I've heard um, Andreas Preuninger and, and Pascal Tulinden, um, respectively heads of the GT and, and motorsport teams, uh, both saying that, you know, there, there is a lot of kind of transfer because road car division does a lot of work on aerodynamics that might benefit what, G, what motorsport program are doing uh, and vice versa. So, again, it's that. It's that efficiency that what's the point of, of two departments taking the same bit of aero or, or trying to achieve the same sort of things with aero? Because the holy grail, as always, is you want as much downforce as you can get for as little drag as you can get. Uh, and that, that works on a road car because you're looking at fuel efficiency, um, but it works on a race car because you're looking at straight line speed. So the goals might be, or the reasons behind the goals might be slightly different. But the, the end result is the same and it makes sense for them to work together. So, yeah, you're right. There's a real, you know, designing in from the outset that this is what the cars are there to do. Do you reckon, do you reckon one tips the other? You know, do you reckon it's, does, uh, do things start in motorsport or do they uh, do they start in, in sort of Vysak Road and, and go one way or the other? Or do you think they just meet in the middle on lots of things? I think so. I mean, it, it, it's a... It's a difficult question to answer, and I've heard that sort of question put to the uh, to the teams um, at various points. And I think it is a difficult one. It, it, it is that sort of chicken and the egg. But I think mm-hmm. it's a very it is a very sort of liquid process how these things evolve. Um, and again, a very kind of yeah, I suppose a very realistic human way of doing it. In that, I think there is an expectation. Um, I can't speak for the reality in, in other businesses, but that everything is corporate, everything is kind of, you know, set in processes and that makes it a bit rigid and inflexible. And I, I can only say I've never I've never come across that with Porsche. Everything seems very human in terms of, you know, what people want to put into it, what the pro- project needs to be, people being 
personally invested in what they think is the right thing to do. So I, I think it is. It's just a very liquid process, which which seems to work. Just um, on a complete tangent, then, um, Rob, as we've dived into um, you know, where you are at Porsche and what you've done and a bit of your racing history and cars you've been in and all the rest of it. Um, in terms of going sort of previous life to, to Porsche, uh, I think you were you were uh, am I again right? Get me tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think you were a barrister back in the day. You were, were you at the bar? Is that right? Yeah. So um, this is this is sort of career number four or five. I've I've sort of lost count. Um, but um, but yes. So uh, I I made the decision. Um, I left. Uh, I raced while I was at university. Um, but but was realistic that even sort of starting at 19 that I was quite late to the party. So uh, never had any aspirations for it to ever be anything other than something I did for fun that I, I just really enjoyed and would do when I could. So when I left university, um, I didn't have the time to, um, you know, to, to uh, sort of put into to racing and, and, and the amount of time and effort it took to raise funds and uh, all, everything that goes with a, a race campaign these days. So uh, I went off to, to work, worked in IT. Um, but always had aspirations to uh, to train for law, um, so uh, that I I did in due course, um, and uh, was called to the bar, um, <laughs> and uh, that was uh, pretty much exactly the same time that the the financial crisis bit. Um, so uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't perfect timing, and I think you know a whole uh, a whole kind of section uh, of, of people that were studying and uh, sort of progressing either into a different career or starting their career refresh found the same thing that the rule book kind of changed a lot uh, in mm-hmm. 2007 2008 um, and and for me it was in a way it was the I suppose the catalyst to make cars and driving my my full-time job it had always been in the background it had always if I'm honest taken up probably a lot more time than it should have done um, <laughs> but uh, um, it, it was an opportunity that, that in the instructing world uh, at that point in time, there was still quite a strong demand. Uh, I don't know why, but, but there was. And it offered me uh, a full time opportunity to uh, to coach and to help um, really people who had a passion for driving get better at, at, at realizing that passion that they had. And, and, I, and I loved it and never looked back. I've, I've been in the industry now since full time since 2008 uh, and, and absolutely loved it. I, I I wouldn't. Uh, I, I wouldn't say I regret it for a moment. Yeah. And is the do you reckon where you are now? Is that is that ticking all the boxes? Is that the um, is that the dream role? I mean, yeah, cars and and in terms of the association with the brand and everything else. I mean, is that the one, or do you think there's still a another foray to go? It's difficult, isn't it? It's, it, it's almost a bit like um, when when F1 drivers kind of win everything under the sun, and it's like, but I still like to do it for Ferrari. Um, <laughs> it's it's a bit like that in our world. It's it, it it's kind of I know a lot of people. Um, you know, certainly for me, it's been a, an aspiration to work with Porsche for a long, long time. So um, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, I I I I haven't really thought about it because yeah, you know, it, it it's a great place to be, and you know, we're lucky that we have so many different diverse elements that we get involved with. Um, and I think for me, different. Everyone works in a different way, and I think. You know, I, I know people um, who like to sit down on a Monday morning, see an in-tray and know that their week is going to be getting through that in-tray. And then on a Friday afternoon, that last thing that's in the in-tray will get filed and then that's it for the weekend. And then they'll repeat on a Monday. And, and that that's kind of really, um, you know, that's really, inco- you know, that, that that's that's the way they like to work. Um, for me, I, I, I hate sort of in a way having that, um, almost having that routine, it, it's nice for some things to not be a complete surprise. But I do like having the fact that at the moment, you know, if no two days are the same. You know, you could be yep having a day in the office doing a bit of paperwork and catching up. Um, then you could be you know jumping on an aeroplane to go to California with Richard Atwood. You know, then you could be you know filming. It, it, it's so varied, and I think just the role itself and 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 the way that fits because the role that I do isn't the same for different manufacturers because different manufacturers will will do things in different ways they have you know different things that are important to them and what they do and I'm just lucky that with Porsche you know all those other things that we do absolutely are on point for the kind of things that that, that I would want to do so 
Um, you know, I, I don't particularly need to go to every Carrera Cup weekend, but I do because, you know, and I don't consider it a day worked because <laughs> I'd be doing that in my spare time anyway. Um, so, so yeah, it's difficult to think of anything that would be such a complete fit. Nice. Nice place to be. Yeah. Give me a shout when you um, decide to finally move on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, away from the Porsche world, I, a little somebody tells me that you, you might have some other toys, um, a bit of a Lotus fan. Is that correct? <laughs> well, yes. I, I, um, it's funny. It, 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 we've talk, talked about the, the, the strong influences in, in, in how I sort of came to, uh, to be at Porsche and, and what made me go that route. And it's um i suppose very topical at the moment with the rise of esports and uh, and and the role that that's currently playing in in everyone's uh, sort of uh, program through uh, through lockdown but um i think uh, for me what sowed the seed it wasn't it wasn't so much even james bond or or anything like that um it, it, it was it was a game that i bought purely by chance for my my atari uh, st in the the crikey must have been early 90s when i was uh was about 10 and um it's funny it just it just so a seed that kind of grew and grew and i think um then they they brought out a sequel to the game that i bought and that had a lotus elan in it and mm-hmm. i remember just seeing the shape and being fascinated by it uh and that was kind of a real kickstarter for then buying car magazines and and pouring over those and spending far too much time at the back of chemistry class reading uh, reading performance car rather than understanding what a molar value was um <laughs> well good, good news i still even remember that it exists which is something <laughs> um so um so yes yeah, so when when um, back in 2004 um i uh, i had the opportunity to uh buy one of two cars i'd identify two things that i wanted to buy for my uh, for my first i've been i've been working sort of four four or so years out of uni and i wanted to buy my first kind of weekend car and i thought right i've got a 50 50 here um i can go with a lotus elan turbo uh, se or i can go with the 968 club sport um because at the time they were kind of around about the same price and um yeah, for reasons uh, <laughs> that every now and again, particularly where I am now, I, I look back on and question. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I chose to go with the uh, with the Elan, uh, which I've subsequently completely rebuilt, top to toe, every nut and bolt. Um, so that's and, the and I, front wheel drive, the Elan. Yes, yes. Yeah. What what one notable journalist uh, described um, as as Lotus's biggest mistake of the last seventy years. Um, <laughs> He he did. I I actually I was at the LA show with him in uh, in 2017, and uh, we were chatting away. And he said, I, "I feel I should say something that, as and when you read Auto Car, <laughs> don't <laughs> don't be upset." Um, so uh, at least I had fair warning. But um, but no, I, I I love it to bits. I think um, you know it, technically it, it's got a lot of cool things. It, it really established the idea of a front wheel drive car. You know, not having things like torque steer, having a separate sort of subframe for the for the front suspension, it it was quite advanced. And I think, um, you know, for all that, for me, it was purely superficial. I, I just fell in love with the shape as a kid, and I think that was the that was the tipping point. And it, it had to be yellow, um, it had to be an SE, um, and uh, and that's why I think I've just spent far too much time and effort on it, um, just because I wanted the experience of what it would have been like to drive it when it was new. Um, but, um, but the good news is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still, uh, still looking at 968 club sports. Um, and it would be really, um, you know, and, and looking at 996 is too, to be honest, because, you know, there's something with the land, it's not something that I'd use on a, on a, you know, on a day to day basis for all the work that I've done. Um, yeah. it, it, it's, it's not something that, that I would, I could use maybe to sort of go to the office because we spend so much time on events um, and out and about that the mileage we do is fairly low. So you could have something as a as a daily that's that's perhaps not you know if you're doing twenty thousand miles a year you might not choose it. Um, but you know with my mileage profile that might be practical. So uh, so I'm, I'm I'm feverishly working through the man math. 
Well, I think, um, uh, well, Andy has got a, a Sunday morning drivers club, the name or title of which he can't actually pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh it's predominantly porsche but i mean it goes without saying rob i think you should bring that lotus down one sunday you can be the uh the honorary honorary <laughs> guest lotus driver for the day i'd be happy to see it it really would um no i'd, I'd, I'd love to thank you no that's, uh, that'd be awesome we we usually finish these uh episodes with interviewees by asking 10 questions they're the same set questions um, we'd like to fire those over to you if if that's okay. We've got, I think, a couple of deviances from the norm. I think Andy's put us question number one here: Can we have a GT2 RS on long term loan? But obviously, I'll scrap, <laughs> I'll scrap that one out now. <laughs> um, our long standing question ten, as well, of course, is: Is the Cayman a real Porsche? But <laughs> um, it's, it's pretty pointless asking you that, isn't it? Because if, if as the senior press officer at Porsche GB says the Cayman is not a real Porsche, then uh, <laughs> we might have <laughs> been a day. Yeah, so I'm, we're going to replace that, if uh, unless, of course, uh, you believe it isn't. It's no, I, I, it, it firmly is, but I'd be I'd be happy to offer an insight as to uh, as to why I think it is. Um, you know, just, then, just to be fair. Go for it. You've got to hear that. I mean, we need that. On there. <laughs> Well, I think the, the, the interesting thing is that, you know, I've had that sort of, in a way, that, that slightly different journey that for me, learning Porsche was something that I did sort of starting in 2016 and, and you know, almost really started from scratch. I'd never really had the opportunity to drive one. Uh, and it was interesting, it, you know, a friend of mine, we, we both sort of started with Renault Sports around about the same time. Um, and, you know, as you progress through, well, he's progressed and I've kind of stayed with front wheel drive cars. Um, but, um, you know, he, he was sort of asking me the question. He said, well, you know, I'm interested in the 911, but I'm also really keen on a Cayman. Um, you know, what's the difference? You know, surely a Cayman does most of what a 911 does. And I think, you know, for me, it, it it's they are quite separate in terms of, you know, the way they feel and the way you interact with them and, and, and the what they offer the driver so i think yeah cayman to me is is all the core values are there and i think that's the important thing is you know what what is a porsche it, it it's a sports car that you can use every day it's something that you know whether it's a, a, a sunny morning in july and it's 18 degrees and you're up at six o'clock to go for a drive or whether it's two degrees in november it's drizzling and it's still dark but you still want to get in and go for the drive it, it's a car that kind of does that and that that's been my learning experience has been just understanding how that kind of strand runs through everything and and we did a really cool event uh, on the isle of man uh back in crikey must have been early 2018 where we had the new gc3 rs but we had the whole lineage right the way back from the 2.7, right the way through the 996 RS, all the way through up to the current car. And and even just sort of riding passenger as, as we sort of went through each generation, it was the same thing that everyone said, is that they all had that common theme. They all had a 911 theme. And it's the same whether you sort of get out of a 996 and you jump into a 992 there's still something quite 911. And that's the same broadly with Porsche is that, you know, I've discovered it, whatever I've jumped into, whether it's been, you know, Macan or Cayenne or Cayman or Boxster or 911, there, there is a sort of a theme that, that runs between them. So I, I would, you know, that would be my take on it. Just, just even putting my, my professional hat to one side, just as a driver, um that that was kind of my my feeling as i as i learned the cars and drove them for the first time mm. no I, I i think that's the definitive synopsis that puts the argument to bed really particularly on this <laughs> uh, we, we appreciate your insight on that rob not only as, as porsche pr but also you're a qualified ards uh <laughs> as well aren't you so i think it stands to good reason so yes i think we'll we'll bury that from now on we have got a replacement 10th question so uh, Rob, if you're ready, we'll fire away. And, and these are these are quick answers, please. You're not allowed to think about it. <laughs> okay. Okay, you're ready. Right. Okay. Question one of ten, Rob. Air or water? Uh, air. Okay. Favorite Porsche model? Uh, Nine eleven. Favorite Porsche color? Miami blue. Ooh, ultimate Porsche icon? 
959. Excellent. Favourite track? Spa. To Foosh or not to Foosh? Not to Foosh. Ooh, interesting. Mm. Stock or hot rod? Stock. Narrow body or wide body? Wide body. Cars and coffee or track day? Track day. (laughs) And uh, in reference to the 911, rear seats or no rear seats? Rear seats. Yeah, interesting. Very good. That's amazing. Rob, why no foosh then? (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm saying this in full awareness um, of the boxes that are probably not so far away from you. Um, (laughs) Joe's bought some as well this week, by the way. (laughs) Um, it, It wasn't so much anything against them. Um, Should we just cancel the interview now? Should we just call it that? <laughs> yeah, it's like, guys, guys, where have you gone? Um, I, I think it is because, purely because of my era, uh, I just remember seeing 996s racing on BBS. Um, and I think, you know, that, that multi-spoke BBS for me was a real kind of like 80s, 90s wheel. So it, it's, don't get me wrong, you know, I, 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 I do love them. But I think if I was having to choose, if I was going to pick one, I'd I'd go BBS because that's just that that's my era, that's my thing. I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, look. I mean, as a uh, coming from a man that's just about to take some BBS wheels off, then I'm never to put some. <laughs> on. Uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll we'll let you know if we air this one, Rob. It's kind of looking like that. <laughs> Um, in, in all seriousness, Rob, we really appreciate your time. It, yeah, it goes you, without saying, as, as we said earlier on in the in the interview, enthusiasts, we cannot absorb this wonderful content if it's not for people like you. And, and certainly from, from us inside the industry, we can't do our job without your diligence and hard work and passion. So thank you for that. Thank you for sharing your your job and your your life with us as well. We're, we're exceedingly grateful. And um, we will see you and your Lotus at a, a breakfast <laughs> very soon, with any doubt, with any luck. Well, thank you. Yeah, hopefully we'll see you soon. And uh, and again, just from our side, you know, we, we, we never we never take it for granted that, 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 you know, we have that passion and that following and, and uh, people like you guys uh, really fueling that because it does motivate us too. So no, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. I do. Thank you very much indeed. Great interview and a great guy, isn't he? Oh yeah, absolutely. That was a that was a good interview. Really enjoyed that. Cool. We've actually got our next interview tied up, signed, sealed, delivered as well, haven't we, Andy? Ready to drop soon? We have indeed. Yeah, uh, great interview with Damon Jones, yes. um, formerly singer, uh, currently Gunther Works, and lots of other uh, really fascinating history as well. So looking yes. forward to that. Yes, been around the automotive uh, mainstream manufacturers as well, if, if, you, if you can call Aston Martin and McLaren mainstream. So really, <laughs> really interesting. Brit abroad, isn't he, flying the flag for us now over in, uh, in Los Angeles. So Indeed. we shall be dropping that one very, very soon. Excellent. Right. See you all soon.